So, uh, I'm going to talk about love and sex addiction. And a lot of people don't like to talk about it, and I guess that's why we have a small crowd this morning. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> and sex addiction is what we call a process addiction. And it very much is an addiction. It affects the pleasure part of the brain. It affects uh, the addict, the sex addict, mentally, emotionally, uh, and makes them uh, spiritually bankrupt. <clears throat> and it uh, can be very departmentalized in that people that are sex addicts can get up, go to work, uh, live out their life, go to church, go to PTA, be with kids, and have a secret life. <clears throat> Through the years, you know, I've been doing this about 50 years, and I guess this, I started at the Serenity House in Abilene, and uh, it was uh, all male clients at the time, and I'll tell you, I knew nothing about sex addiction or love addiction and my male clients taught me they taught me more than i've ever wanted to know uh, and it was really the core uh, to a lot of their problems and yes they were alcoholic uh, and uh, but the sexual acting out would start usually at a very young age and what we would see <clears throat> with uh, you know, of course, even then, and, you know, most of what I've done in my career has been God-directed. There wasn't any, you know, workshops or anything to go to. There wasn't. But anyway, uh, I think God just gave me some, I don't know, some knowledge. But anyway, uh, I learned early on to take people back to their childhood because that's where things uh, were that thoughts are formulated. And so what I would see, and then when I met my friend Pia Melody, she just validated my reality uh, in this. Because what I would see with those male, <clears throat> because we did at that time only uh, had men later on. I mean, we were co-ed, but there just weren't any women going into treatment at that time. So, <clears throat> and what I would discover is uh, and I don't know where I got the, I mean, this was before I went to treatment, before I had much therapy. I mean, I didn't have any therapy. I haven't had any. But anyway, long story short, I'm just dis giving a disclaimer of what how this evolved, <clears throat> that I would work individually with those clients. Uh, and that was in my work addiction days, 80, 90 hours a week. <clears throat> but I would take them back to their childhood. And invariably, now, you know, keep in mind, we treated some really low bottom people at the Serenity House at that time. You know, coming out of prison, coming out of, you know, we had parolees, we had, you name it. Uh, you know, we had one that was a hit man for the mafia. I mean, I, we had some tough characters. But there was something about God gave me a lot of grace in working with those men. And I guess I treated them more like my kids or something. But I would take them back to their childhood and have them write about their childhood. <clears throat> and invariably, invariably, there would be this conflict. I mean, if they were sex addicts, if they had a problem in the sex, you know, and not all of the alcoholics did, but there was a, a, a section that would have uh, these sexual acting out problems. <clears throat> and we didn't even know the term sex addiction then. But what would happen in writing about their childhood, <clears throat> invariably they would have this uh, conflict with their mother in that and what the conflict would be, would be uh, the mother would have conflict. And th this was a pattern that she kept showing up over and over. <clears throat> the mother would have conflict with her husband or maybe had no husband, but, but usually they'd have a husband, but there would be no relationship. There'd be no connection and maybe there'd be uh, domestic violence in the home. 
And what that uh, little boy would do is start masturbating early on in his bed while he was listening to that domestic violence. And then his mother, not having a relationship with her husband, would form a relationship with her son like what we what Pia gave us the word I didn't know what the word was but the engulfment the, the mother would start to engulf the child the the his her son and make her son much more than what he was he was a kid he was a little boy a lot of times that mother will put that little boy up on a pedestal he will she will make him like her little man taking places <clears throat> you know that he, as an escort, you know, where her husband didn't want to go, he would, she would make him feel real special. And that's dangerous for to treat a child special because all, every child is unique and different. But when you start treating children, anyway, that's what, that's the pattern we'd see over and over. Uh, of, and I'm not blaming this on mothers, don't hear that but it would be that engulfment where she would take that child and hold on and you know that energy needs to go that love energy needs to go from the parent to the child not the child to the parent and what this type of mother was wanting was wanting that little boy to fill up that love space in her heart that her husband didn't feel. So she would go in there to get something for that child. And children know that. Children have a knowing about that. And so consequently, every one of them that I you know, would work with, they would describe pushing away from their mothers early on. But, and they would grow up really uh, liking sex, but not liking women so much. I mean, they would be, uh, many of them would not, you know, they would have multiple relationships, multiple marriages, or they would have secret relationships. Uh, because, and it would start in that abnormal relationship with their mother. Uh, and then you can flip that to a woman you know, there's women sex addicts. And what that usually looks like is <clears throat> in there again, the father will make this, her, the daughter, her, his little princess, put her up on a pedestal, make her more than what she is. Uh, and, you know, it can go as far as sexually abusing the child. Not all the time, but it is what happens to the child, how that child begins to feel about themselves, their own sexuality, and they learn to act out uh, sexually at a very early age. So in talking about sex addiction, I kind of gave you that little background. A lot of times it starts very early. Sex addicts, most of them, married many of them will have families uh, you know i think when people think about sex addicts they think about people living under the bridge you know perverted in, and I, maybe some of those guys people are sex addicts but we're not talking about that sex addiction is like any other addiction it has a starting place a middle place and then it has that very progressive place I mean, it is pro a progressive disease, uh, and, you know, it is fatal, left untreated. The bottom line for love addiction and sex addiction is homicide or suicide. Pick up a newspaper uh, from any large city, and invariably there will be an article in there where someone has killed their wife or their husband and then kill themselves. That's the bottom line for love and sex addiction. Uh, or, you know, uh, get picking up a disease. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that uh, can uh, harm a sex addict, not even counting the psychological part. Okay, so there's a wide variety of sex, uh, sexual acting out. Uh, and majority of it is secretive. 
I know, and I will say this, I meant to look it up, and I will for, will you look this up for me, just Google it, uh, my little assistant sitting oh. over here making out a grocery list, I think. My and, phones are both on Oh here. yeah, she can't, because her phone's uh, on here. Can, anyway. Cam can do it for you. Anyway, I don't know what the percentage is, uh, but we live in a town where there's three religious universities. And we've treated many, many sex addicts out of these church-related universities. Uh, and we find in highly religious people, and I am not criticizing anyone, I'm not, I'm just giving you some facts that I have experienced in being in the field for many years. Uh, many of them come out of religious, highly religious homes. Uh, and they will have a secret life. And, uh, you know, we've treated ministers, we've treated professors from these universities, uh, and they come in, and it's sad because they are so guilty. They feel so guilty about their sexual acting out. And it's not just in churches, but they're, I'm, I have wondered, the, the, the ratio of people coming out of religious bodies, uh, what I see is there's a higher rate of eating disorders and sex sexual disorders and highly religious bodies. But anyway, I'm gonna get slammed for that, so I better just go on and <laughs> finish what I was gonna do here. Um, anyway, uh, what it is, is uh, a sex addict uses uh, sex, unhealthy use of sex, uh, and it can be progressive, like I said, uh, and it may start early, like I said, it could start with an addiction to masturbation. You know, and masturbation, that is a, a human thing that, and little boys particularly, and little girls, but little boys particularly, find themselves very early and they you know, give themselves that relief. And so that can start their own sexual feelings very early. And if parents don't make a big issue about it, you know, that's just part of growing up. <clears throat> but if it continues, if the masturbation continues on a chronic basis in their adult life, it can turn to uh, sex addiction. And what that looks like a lot of times is, you know, because the next one on the list is pornography. Pornography is a form of sex addiction, and it can be like today's time. You know, used to, it was what they call the dirty magazines, but today's time, you know, you can get anything in the world that you want on, I guess, I haven't looked it up, but I'm told you can get, and I quit that laughing camp, I'm told that you can get most anything that you might want over the internet. Uh, so it's uh, accessible, and so uh, pornography is very much a part of sex addiction, and then many clients will uh, connect the masturbation with the pornography, and you know, and many of these clients are married, and they, what they do is they do not have a relationship with their partner. They'll have a superficial relationship, but I'll tell you, this kind of addiction takes up a lot of time, and it is time spent. I'll tell you, I've worked with people that, sex addicts, that will be at work, and will, I mean, find, I mean, be in a, let's say, a large corporation, and they, you know, will be known in that business as the uh, lover boy or whatever. But, you know, part of being a sex addict is that living on the razor's edge and getting away with something. You know, I've heard horrendous stories of, you know, them going into the bathroom and taking someone from, you know, the secretary pool or something. And they're, you know, at a coffee break, not even lunch, just a coffee break, just a little quickie thing, you know. I mean, sex addicts can find a way to, I mean, y'all are just spellbound. You're not even blinking. <laughs> anyway, uh, sex addicts can find a way to act out 
anywhere. And it, like I said, it is progressive. It starts, you know, we'll start with maybe masturbation and then it grows and grows. And it, uh, so here I go. I mean, it's, uh, and it really uh, progresses to dangerous behavior. It's like, like I said, it's that walk in a tight rope and they it's almost like they want to to get caught uh, this is something and I've hesitated to even no I'm not going to tell it I'm not going to tell it because it's I've got kids and grandkids that have uh, that remember my dad is their papa I'm not going to tell it here but anyway I experienced a lot in my childhood that no child should have experienced. Uh, and, you know, they would never be arrested as child molesters or anything because so much happens inside the home. Anyway, to carry on, uh, is the essence of an addiction is the addict experiences powerlessness. If they don't experience powerlessness, over their compulsive behavior <clears throat> resulting uh, in their life becoming unmanageable, they will never want any help. It's like they do have to hit some kind of a bottom. That's kind of a play on words, but anyway. Bradley, it's good to see your name up there. Uh, I woke up this morning praying for you, and I know you're having some medical challenges, but just want you to know that uh, Misty and I pray for you. So you're prayed up this morning. So it's good to see your name up here. All right. Uh, and we love you a lot. And God's going to be with you. All right. So the unmanageability uh, that the addict goes through uh, can be seen as consequences like losing relationships, losing families, having difficulties at work, uh, arrest, financial troubles, a loss of interest in things that are not sexual, low self-esteem and despair. Uh, so sexual preoccupation takes up tremendous amounts of energy. And speaking of energy, <clears throat> you can almost, if you kind of get tuned to people's energy, you can almost know when you're in the presence of a sex addict. I've had the opportunity, and I mean, to uh, be in the presence of Bill Clinton on several occasions at the White House, different places. And when he enters the room, that energy, that sexual energy just oozes out of ever poor, you know. And you can, and that's not just him, you can usually tell with, with people, not all people, but they put off an energy that is like electricity and it draws people to them. And it can draw non-sexual people to them, but it draws sexual addicts, draws people. I mean, I'm not going to get into all that, but a lot of your mega church preachers are also sex addicts. But anyway, we'll leave that for another time. Because uh, it's, it's, I think I've gone quit sharing and gone to meddling. So, anyway, and, and sex addicts will swear, swear that they're not going to do it again. Like, you know, we're not al alcoholics where they're not going to ever drink again. A sex addict will never, you know, will, will just about get caught, just about get picked up and put in jail. Uh, and they swear they're never going to do it again. And then they'll start small by going back by flirting, you know, flirting with people. Uh, well, women or men, depending on their, you know, choice. Uh, and they'll go back to searching for pornography on the internet or driving or cruising, you know, cruising around the park or cruising around town. They know the places to go to hook up with people. So, and, and when they get into, when the acting out happens, there is a denial of feelings. It's like they have no feelings other than sexual. Uh, and it's usually followed by despair and shame. 
that it, and that feeling of hopelessness, that in describes the addiction cycle. For any addiction, it starts with a feeling and then the thought and then the action and then, you know, we get something out of acting out in any addiction or we wouldn't do it, you know. So you get that feeling of oh, sense of ease and comfort and then you come around to the bottom and you get to feeling guilt and remorse and there is so much shame connected with, more shame connected with sex addiction than any other addiction, I, I believe. All right, so let me go briefly over these, uh, how you know if you might be a sex addict. Uh, secrets about sexual or, or romantic activities from those uh, important to you. you. You live a secret life is what that's about. You lead a double life. Uh, you know, a lot of most sex addicts can be married, get up and go to work, have a high position in church or, or the business world. Uh, but this is a secret part of their life. They lead a double life. Uh, and then a lot of times their needs, their sexual needs will drive them into places in situations uh, with people that they would never want to be seen with. You know, there are places outside of Abilene, Texas <laughs> on, on the outskirts. And every time I go west to Lubbock or anything, I see this one place, and I'm not gonna give you the address or anything, but anyway, uh, I've worked with so many sex addicts and that would be where they would go. And you, you know, it's, uh, I mean, for the afternoon and anyway. Alrighty, because there's different ways to act out sexually. And uh, people provide uh, I mean, you can go in and pay for this in the middle of the afternoon. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, a sex addict is looking for sexually arousing articles, like, uh, you know, scenes in newspapers or magazines or, or other media. They feed off of that. They feed off of it. Uh, they find that romantic or sexual fantasies interfere with their relationships. <clears throat> with you know, they may be married, but their fantasies will interfere with a relationship with their spouse. Uh, and so, the fantasy every sex addict I've ever worked with lives in a fantasy, lives in a fantasy. And the thing about it, they don't want to a relationship with those people that they're having sex with. They want to be, you know, have the home fires burning at home. They want a mate. They want a family. That sometimes, if you know, when they're not in recovery, uh, you know, when I mean, they'll act out sexually with their own partner, or they will have, they will block out uh, the face that they're having sex with. So, uh, and then when they, sex addicts want to, the minute they have sex, they want to get away. They are done over it. There's no hugging. There's no caressing. There's no after, you know, if they're done. Uh, you know, they're done with the sex partner. Uh, and they, and I've already said this, but they frequently feel remorse, shame, and guilt over a sexual encounter. Uh, they feel shame about their body or their sexuality. Uh, and particularly if they have, uh, have grown up in uh, where, you know, uh, where having a same sex relationship is, <clears throat> I'll tell you, you know, when in the South, the buckle on the Bible belt, where if people grow up where, you know, it is so talked about, talked down about gay people and all that. I'll tell you what, if on Thursdays, if every person in Abilene, Texas, you pick the town, anywhere across the South, if every person that was gay on any given day, let's say Thursday, wore purple, you would see a wave of purple. 
You know, this is the sad part. A lot of gay people marry straight people so they can look uh, acceptable. And then it ruins that marriage. And anyway, uh, we see it over and over and over and over. So, uh, anyway, uh, so <clears throat> the uh, relationship, there's really, for sex addicts, there's really not a relationship. And if they do try to have a relationship, they get bored really quick and they'll move to someone else, to someone else. And uh, the, uh, the progression of it is, what is the progression is the variety, the type of sex they have, the frequency, and the romantic uh, activities, uh, there's none. They w they'll get to be none. Uh, and uh, it's not about romance. It's about the release of the sex addict, at the sex uh, act, and it's about the getting away with. It's about the release of the sex act. Uh, and so what happens then is people, uh, <clears throat> you know, how you know if you really are a sex addict is if you have ever gotten uh, arrested and they, uh, live in fear of that, particularly if they have practice, uh, you know, of uh, voyeurism, uh, exhibitionist, prostitution, sex with minors, indecent phone calls. These are getting into legal problems. Legal problems. Uh, I had a man that drove 600 miles to come up here years and years and years and years ago. He'd come once a week because he didn't trust anyone for, I mean, he was a very high profile man. And uh, the sex addiction, he could not stop. And I will tell you, I didn't have, I mean, anyway, what we did is we did the 12 steps. I did the 12 steps with him. I helped him to get honest. Uh, and there's sometimes, you know, sex addicts, once they start in recovery, they just want to go and get real clean with particularly their, their uh, spouse. Don't do that. Have some discernment about that. And there's got to be a fine line about you know, because sometimes when they want to clean their act up and they want to get real honest with their mate, they will say things and they get a high off of describing the sex act. So anyway, I worked with that man for several years. Uh, he had a private plane. He'd come up here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hear from him periodically. He has grandkids. He has great grandkids. And, uh, you know, he'll thank me periodically, and, but we treated it as an addiction because it is an addiction. And his started in childhood. Okay, so by this time, the progression is, you know, uh, a sex addict is doing things that they can be arrested over, uh, and uh, there is no spiritual spirituality, even if they're married, that has pretty much gone out the door uh, and the co-sex addict, and I'll talk about the co-sex addict in a minute. Sometimes they don't know. They don't know for sure. They, they just know there is something missing in their relationship. And what they make up is about them. They've done something, you know. And so I'll get into that in a minute uh, about the co-sex addict. Uh, what will happen is they up the ante to where a sex addict, it's really like a gambling addict. They have to up the ante. <clears throat> uh, and it's they'll take uh, more risk and more risk and more risk because that's where the high comes from, is the, the risk taking and the hiding. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're talking about people that have, uh, I mean, they're all across the spectrum. It's not just, you know, certain types of people, but there are people that you would never dream, never dream of that are sex addicts. 
and it is a very secretive disease. Uh, and they, a lot of times, will have do their sexual acting out out of town. A lot of these people are conference goers. <laughs> Conferences sometimes are just places for people to act. I mean, I won't get into all of that. You get the idea. Uh, and people, you know, will hook up, the, you know, every year, same place, this time next year. So uh, this is, in all of this that I'm saying, if, one, if you can identify with one of these things, you might want to look at being a sex addict. Even one of them, you might want to look into that. So I want to talk about the co-sex addict for a minute. In the co-sex addict, I was going to talk about the love addict. And the love addict is wanting love, 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 love. Now, and sometimes a love addict is not always a co-sex addict, but sometimes they are. So they kind of dovetail into each other. <clears throat> but a love addict is seeking love and attention. Now, a lot of times what this their background looks like is, <clears throat> you know, pick any addiction. Let's say they were raised by an alcoholic father. They were raised by, uh, and ministers' kids. We've worked with them, a bunch of them. You know, I mean, I've had them to where, you know, they'll be, the family would be ready to go on a vacation. And the minister will get a call, you know, at that time they had to go in the house and answer the phone. Uh, and the kids would not even want them to answer the phone because invariably they knew that there was going to be a church member wanting something. You know, and a lot of times they uh, there'd be a death. They'd have to go back out and tell the family, we can't go on vacation because I've got, you know, to take care of this church member. So your, your minister's <clears throat> kids grow up with that disconnect a lot of times. That what we call that is the back walking away. Now we're not saying I'm not saying anything bad off or wrong about ministers, because but their focus is on their congregation unless they are really tuned attuned to uh, families, you know, and knowing, you know, and being able to uh, provide time for for their families. But the uh, the uh, preachers' kids that we that come here that we've worked with. They come in with that. My dad never spent time with me. It was always about the church and about the ministry. Uh, and so any addiction will do. <clears throat> so this little girl was raised up, let's say by an alcoholic, and he was never at home. And when he was, he was drunk. And so what she gets used to is a, a male figure not being there for her. So what she gets addicted to is that back walking away. You know, she gets used to trying to get dad's attention, trying to get his attention. <clears throat> and it can be reversed with the son with an alcoholic mother, trying to get their attention. And the focus is on the drug alcohol. And so the child feels like <clears throat> that, uh, that they don't matter uh, and that they go out in the world trying to seek someone to love them. It's almost like they have an unbiblical cord out, uh, love me, love me, love me, will someone love me? Well, and we seek what is familiar. You'd think someone that was raised where they didn't get a lot of love would go out and try to find someone to love them, but what they go toward is someone that can't be there for them. Any addiction will do. Alcoholism, sex addiction, <clears throat> work addiction, you name it. Because what that child is used to is the back walking away. Are you with me? Because father was never there and she spent her life trying to get him engaged, you know, trying to show him her new clothes or trying to get him to look at her, her homework, always trying to get him engaged in paying attention to her. And it can be work addicts, it can be ministers, it can be anyone that is out of the home a lot uh, and they don't have that connection with that 
child. So they grow up then to be, <clears throat> can grow up to be co-sex addicts because they're, are co-alcoholics because they go after people that can, that's not available. They will pick them out across a crowded room. And I will tell you, if a, a love addict was to find someone that's very attentive, that really wanted to come close and be there for them, the intimacy would, I mean, would scare them to death. Uh, because a love addict does not know about intimacy and they had that fear because they've been raised to seek it, the intimacy. But when it comes toward them, I mean, it's like they lose their breath. They, can't, they don't know how to take in the love. They know how to seek it, but they don't know how to take it in when someone turns on them and tries to give them love. And what the love addict will do, they'll turn around and they'll become the back walking away. We see it all the time. All right, let me go through these uh, characteristics quickly of a uh, co-sex addict. Uh, what they, they mistake intensity uh, for intimacy, you know, that high energy. Uh, they, uh, in a relationship, they uh, mistake that for sexual and for intimacy. Uh, and they have to, co-sex addicts have to guess at what a healthy sexual behavior uh, feels like or what it's like, and they feel inadequate sexually. Uh, particularly if they really, and most of your uh, co-sex addicts know that they're li uh, married to a, or living with, or whatever, cohabitating with a sex addict. They know that. If they don't, they find out pretty quick. And what they do, then they become this co-sex addict begins to feel very inadequate, sexual, inadequate sexually. Uh, and then they just start they start assessing their worth by comparing sex appeal uh, and attractiveness. This is where they'll try to doll up, and the, you know, if it's a woman, they'll try to doll up. They'll try to lose weight. They'll try to and it has nothing the same. Now, I will tell you, majority of your sex addicts are married. That's another thing with them, but they're married. The sex addiction in this, in working with co-sex addicts, what I work with them on, this is not, their addiction is not about you. It is not, and that is hard to try to explain that to a co-sex addict. You know, like an, an alcoholic's drinking is not about the non-alcoholic. This is a disease. Now the co-sex addict is very much affected and she or he will change her behavior any way to get that, you know, spouse attracted to them. And they, and the, and the sex addict is attracted to their partner in a different way than sex partners. It's an entirely, it's a drug. The sex is used as a drug. It's not about a relationship. It's about the release of the sex act. So the co-sex addict has to have, I think, as much help, if not more, than the sex addict does. Because uh, once you get a sex addict to really claim the addiction and see the deadliness of it, and what I mean, they're relieved and they want to stop but it's so secretive, uh, they usually very seldom will go in, enter treatment for sex addiction per se. That's why I'm glad there's, there are some treatment centers that focus strictly on sex addiction. <clears throat> and it's hard to get a sex addict to go to treatment because they don't want that title. So anyway, uh, go back to the co-sex addict. Uh, what happens is we get, you know, uh, co-sex addicts will get blinded. They play like it's not happening. They'll make excuses for, uh, you know, why they're not showing up, you know, why the partner's not showing up at family, you know, situations or why they're late or whatever. Uh, and, you know, for a co-sex addict, a lot of times they don't even recognize uh, their uh, loved ones sexually uh, abusive behavior. They take, they think, I mean, 
everything they do, the sex addict, it becomes normal for the non sex for the co sex addict. They take they don't know how to recognize other sexually abusive behavior. Uh, and they mistake obsession with love for sex. And a sex uh, a love addict, a co sex addict will give sex when they're wanting love. And what they do is uh, the partners will try to fix the relationship with sex. Now I'm here to tell you, uh, and I, we've worked with a bunch of them, the co-sex addict will try to change themselves so they will be more attracted to the sex addict. And it has nothing to do with them. It has nothing, it's a separate entity altogether. And you try to talk uh, to share this with the co-sex addict, <clears throat> you know, and that you know most co-sex addicts a lot of times will not stay in the marriage. And what I tell them, if you'll just stay, you become different and give your partner a chance to become different. And there, if there's a least bit of love left in this relationship, you can wind up with a healthy relationship. But you've got to convince the co-sex addict that what her partner or his partner has is an addiction. It's not them just, you know, going out with someone. It is an addiction and it has to be treated like that. You know, it's, it's hard to treat sex addiction because of the thoughts of what people have about sex in particular. Okay, uh, what happens is to the non, uh, uh, to the co-sex addict, they feel they have a, they're terrified of being abandoned. Uh, and they will put up with sexual abuse and sexual acting out and, un, and unfaithfulness just in order to hold on to a relationship. They'll put up with such ungodly <laughs> behavior just to hold on to that relationship. Divorce will never cross their lips. Uh, and they don't know, a co-sex addict does not know the word no. They do not know the word N-O, no. They say yes, or they mean no. Uh, and <laughs> co-sex addicts mistake control for security. A lot of your sex addicts are very controlling people. So your co-sex addict, and they'll be controlling about the family budget, and they'll be controlling about how you keep house, they'll be controlling about the meals you put on the table, and they, the co-sex addict takes that as security in the relationship. Well, he really does love me because he's so interested in what I'm doing. In my, I mean, it's both sides get sick. Okay. So what they do then is they'll do another tactic. If, you know, cooking and keeping house won't keep them at home, then what they do is they begin to be flirtatious or seductive behavior uh, to manipulate others. They may sit in church and flirt with a deacon two aisles over, not that they want to flirt with the deacon, but they want their spouse to see that they are attracted to somebody else, that somebody else would want them. It becomes a cat and mouse game, you know, and uh, they will manipulate. Your, this is your co-sex addict. They will manipulate through their own seductive behavior in their own uh, being flirtatious. So it will show the sex addict, see, I am wanted. I am desired by other men. This is a tricky deal, folks. <laughs> okay, so uh, a, a co-sex addict cannot identify their own sexual wants and needs. They're, they're clueless. Uh, but they obsessed about their partner's uh, needs, and they will do anything to try to meet their partner's needs. Uh, and then they feel a lot of shame. They're the ones that carry the shame of their partner's sexual acting out. And they, too, will try attempt to cover them up, particularly if they're 
you know, married to a high profile. I mean, we can all name them. They're everywhere. We've seen them, heard about them, movie stars, ministers, golf, I mean, the uh, sports figures. There's sex addicts in every walk of life. And many times the co-sex addict will try to cover up for them because they don't want to rock the boat at home. Uh, and the co-sex addict, uh, addict feel shame about their own sexuality uh, and uh, and so they care the co-sex addict really cares a lot of shame for the whole situation uh, they stuff their feelings of anger resentment and sometimes uh, will get even uh, I mean they'll get even with their uh, partner sexual behavior by you know, going and hanging out at a bar for an afternoon. And they're not that kind of person, but they will do that to say, see, I am attracted to other people. And they'll sort of kind of go over, try to go on that other side of sexual behavior, but that's not who they are. That's not who they are. Uh, so uh, your co-sex addicts a lot of times feel empty during and after sex. Uh, and the co-sex addicts uh, sometimes believe uh, that they must be loved in order to survive. If they're not loved by uh, someone, you know, a partner, that they're not, they can't survive without it. And they use sexuality to buy love. Uh, they will, I mean, they use sex to try to keep the sex addict at home. Uh, and to try to buy love. Well, I don't even, uh, I'm not going to go over the love addiction because it's similar to this, uh, but I, I want to free up time for any of y'all to say that's mainly, you know, what I've talked about is sex addiction and co sex uh, addiction. And it is a, a hard addiction to face. But I will tell you, it's very, very, very treatable. And it all goes back to the childhood. If you don't get some early childhood treatment around, you know, your childhood, look at what happened to that little girl or that little boy, you will continue on the path of trying to fill up that hole in the soul with the sexual acting out. And for the co-sex addict to educate the co-sex addict enough for they can can let themselves off the hook that this their partner is not seeking sex outside the marriage because they don't find their partner attractive that they're seeking sex outside of the marriage because that is what sex addicts do i mean that is all a part of it and it becomes the secretiveness of it uh, and that don't ever think they can't be treated, they can be, and they can live, both parties can live a very healthy life. All right, that's all I've got. It's a lot. I hope someone will, I know that people on YouTube and different ones will watch this, and so I know all of y'all on here, and but I hope this will help people that have not been to treatment, that have not address some of their own issues. So I hope it will enlighten some people. All right, who wants, does anyone have anything they want to say? <laughs>